If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. Well, the Lord must grant us the grace to say what we will say from now on in a way that will build his kingdom rather than tear it apart. 1844 in type and anti-type, that's just the beginning. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's our text for the series. And I want to remind you again that it has to do with discernment. Discernment. The day that changed the world. You know, some people have all kinds of dates that changed the world. September 11, they like that. But the day that really changed the world was October 22, 1844. That changed the world totally. A totally new world emerged after that day. That's the date that led to a new understanding and opened the floodgates of heaven to prophetic and doctrinal insight. Didn't exist in this form before. The day that ushered in the hour of judgment, put Mordecai in the gate. We'll do a lecture on that later. It was the day for the restoration of the old waste places, the restoration of paths to dwell in. And five great Bible principles were discovered and presented to the world after that date. Hmm. And Satan hates them. He hates those Bible principles. And the way was prepared by both the powers and the conflict, the one to spread this message universally and the other to counteract it. Everything started in 1844. So let's have a look at it, just briefly. I know I've given whole lectures on 1844, I don't want to be repetitive, but it was a leap year in more ways than one. It was a mega year. Let's have a look at the five pillars of Adventism that uh, came after the disappointment between April and September 1848. And they were known as Sabbath conferences, and these were the pillars. The sanctuary doctrine. Is it under attack, yes or no? Yes. yes. The doctrine of the second advent, putting it off, minimalizing it. The Sabbath, the state of the dead, and the spirit of prophecy. Those are mega pillars, not one peg to be moved. And out of these, the realization emerged of the context of the three angels' messages. And this had to go to the whole world. This is Adventism. If this is not part and parcel of what we are and what we stand for, then we're not Adventists. This is Adventism. Not one peg. The great plan of redemption is revealed in the closing work of the last days. 
that should be closely examined. The scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all that they might be able to impress others. All need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement which is going on in the sanctuary above. These are advent truths which are discarded almost in the world today. And when this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God and their efforts will be successful. By study, contemplation and prayer, God's people will be elevated above common earthly thoughts and feelings, will be brought into harmony with Christ. They will see their own defects. We've talked about that. But these pillars of the Advent truth is what makes this message what it is. The first angel's message announcing the hour of God's judgment, calling upon men to fear and worship him, was designed to separate the professed people of God from the corrupting influences of the world and to arouse them to see their true condition of worldliness and backsliding. In this message, God has sent to the church a warning which if it had been accepted by the world out there, would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. But they didn't accept them. And that's part and parcel of the history of God's church through the ages. So God wanted a final reformation to commence in 1844. And then God would have called these people out of all the churches into this wonderful truth, and everybody could have gone home. 1844, the Seventh-day Baptist Rachel Oakes challenged the Millerite preacher Frederick Wheeler to keep all the commandments of God. 1844. And Frederick Wheeler then preached his first sermon on the Sabbath in March 1844. So the Sabbath was rediscovered, 1844. Charles Fitch wrote in 1844 that he accepted the biblical teaching of the conditional immortality of the soul. There it comes. 1844, Spirit of Prophecy. Yes, William Foy, Hazen Foss, Ellen Harmon in December 1844. So 1844 saw the reestablishment of the Spirit of Prophecy. That's no good having a message if it doesn't go to the world. So in the same year, God opens the doors so that it could be broadcast. 1844, Samuel Morse sent his first message over the wires. And I like, I like what he said. The very first message was, What hath God wrought? That's the first message that went across the wires on this planet. It's incredible. He was the son of a Calvinist minister. He authored foreign... Cons Ooh, he would have been a conspiracy theorist. Foreign conspiracy against the liberties of the United States in which he warned his countrymen of the great Jesuit conspiracy to overthrow the liberties of Protestant freemen secured by the Constitution. He was a dangerous man. <laughs> well, isn't that fascinating? So the message... And the means to broadcast it. Out of that humble beginning, what do we have today? Satellite and all of these things. It wouldn't have been possible. Then, March 12, 1844, Columbus and Xenia Railroad, the first railroad that is planned to be built in Ohio, is chartered. And here we go. Suddenly the world started shrinking. So that the message could go to the entire world. Isaiah 30 verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. Here it was possible. 1844. Archaeology. 1798. I like these dates. Don't you like them? End of the 1,260 days, Napoleon Bonaparte has his expedition, sees Malta in Egypt. On this expedition, Merrill Unger writes, modern archaeology may be said to have had its beginning in 1798. 
when the rich antiquities of the Nile Valley were opened up to the scientific study by Napoleon's expedition. Hmm. And then the Danish scholar Niels Ludwig Westerart deciphered the Elamite cuneiform on the Behastan inscription in 1844. So Daniel comes to life in which year? 1844, supported by the science of archaeology. Wow, God is amazing. Besides Millerism and Adventism, 1844 saw the birth of Baha'ism. All the churches are one. Be ye not separate, come together. Communism, Darwinism, Mormonism, Spiritism, Dispensationalism. Can you believe that all these things came into existence in 1844? In the exact year? Existentialism, Quakerism, as we have already mentioned, Millerism, Seventh-day Advent. In, in addition, the Sinaiticus manuscripts were discovered. And Ecumenism. All of them in 1844. That's amazing. Oikomena, the whole inhabited world, says the World Council of Churches. Let's look at some of these dates. 1821, James Haldane Stewart promotes ecumenism and a prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Went further than Jonathan Edwards, that's another important man, organized a regular union for prayer. Edwin Irvin, founder of the Catholic Apostolic Church. And he was still at this time a Presbyterian. So they're working in 1821. And by 1844, they have the first ecumenical organization called the YMCA. Isn't it interesting how they always start with the youth? How did Hitler start? With the youth. So 1844 in England, they start the YMCA. And then they start working further into denominational cooperation. John Mott, founder, was a Freemason, student volunteer. With Moody, the evangelical foreign mission they started. Then the National Council of Churches and eventually the Evangelical Alliance. 1846 came into being. The World Evangelical Alliance, here we are. Christians from 10 countries met in London in 1846. So 1844, the first organization was there with the youth. And there they go. Of launching in their own words a new thing in church history, a definite organization for the expression of unity amongst Christian individuals belonging to different churches. So on the one hand, there's a call, come out of her, my people. And on the other hand, there's a call which says, come into her, my people. Two diametrically opposite messages. Look at these interesting dates here again. 1843, a meeting in Scotland commemorating the 200th anniversary of the Westminster Assembly, which is Protestant, separating, in the same place, the same venue, the opposite. Let's join up the Evangelical Alliance. And... Uh, where do they meet? In the Freemason Hall in London. But we're not talking conspiracies. I don't want to be in the same category as Morse. <laughs> so let's move on. Then we come to an interesting point. The typology of all the movements of God in individuals and in his church. That's fascinating for our time. And let's read it. The history of the wilderness life of Israel was chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God till when? Till the close of time? The record of God's dealing with the wanderers in the desert in all their marchings to and fro in their exposure to hunger, thirst, weariness, striking manifestations of His power for their relief is fraught with warning and instruction for His people in all ages. The varied experience of the Hebrews was a school of preparation for the promised home in Canaan. God would have his people in these days review with a humble heart and teachable spirit the trials through which ancient Israel passed, that they may be instructed in the preparation for the heavenly Canaan. So that story has something for me, right? 
Let's have a look what happened to them and see what happened to us. Bitter disappointment turning sweet. Exodus 15:22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And there they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Where did they come from? From the Egypt. And they just come from the what? The Red Sea. What happened at the Red Sea? The Red Sea parted in front of them and they went through on dry land. They just witnessed this and they went how many days? Three days. And they found no water. And then they come to Mara. And they could not drink of the water of Mara for they were bitter. Is there a parallel with a bitter experience somewhere along the line after a great expectation? Therefore the name of it was called Mara, which means bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Uh, do you recall something about being bitter and turning sweet as honey? Uh, there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Now here we have a picture of Mara. This is where the waters went bitter. So to this day there is this witness and the water is sweet. Had Adventists after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people. It would have been over. So we should actually be grateful that they failed, right? <laughs> sure, or else we wouldn't be there. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith, thus the work was hindered and the work was left in darkness. Maranatha. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. Now note, the same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. We look at them and we say how stupid they were without realizing we're more stupid than they were. The same sins... In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, worldliness, unconsecration, strife amongst the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow for so many years. We are repeating the history of Israel in type and anti-type. Charge it not to God. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination for many more years, as did the children of Israel, but for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course. We may hasten the day by giving the gospel to the world. We can do it. We can change things. So we must study ourselves to be approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, shun the profane babblings, for they will do what? Increase unto more ungodliness. Their eat word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is, and then he mentions a couple of people who concerning the truth have heard, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. We have many examples in our church of things like this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We've discussed that already in the message to Laodicea. The problem lies here. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but wood and earth and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared in every good work. 
So this character has to be built brick by brick, piece by piece. Those characteristics which enable the youth to labor successfully in God's cause must be obtained by diligent exercise of their faculties by improving every advantage providence gives them. The characters of Joseph and Daniel are good models to follow. So God has given us examples. We'll talk about some of these things later. Jesus would have all who profess his name become own earnest workers. It is necessary that every individual member build upon the rock. A storm is arising that will wrench and test the spiritual foundation of everyone to the uttermost. It's coming. Therefore, avoid the sand bed, hunt for the rock, dig deep, lay your foundation, build for eternity, build with tears, prayer, and make your life beautiful with good works. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that they will raise unto David a righteous bronze. We preached the whole message about that. Therefore, behold, the days come, and they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought us up, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord liveth, who brought up and led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I have driven them, they shall dwell in their own land. So they will no longer say, How the Lord led us out of Egypt. We will say, How he brought us out of Babylon. Two gatherings. One then, one now. The typical, an example for the anti-typical. What they did, we can do better. We can prove it too. So the delivery from Egyptian bondage, which was the greatest event recorded in the history of Israel, this only prefigured a greater deliverance of God's people in the final gathering of the antitypical Israel. And if we study what they did, we will find the exact equivalence in our church. And if we can just realize this, if we can just wake up one or two, it would be a miracle. Isaiah chapter 11, 10 to 12, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign, a sign of the people. It shall, to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest will be glorious. So there will be this sign, this banner that will be lifted up. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand. The what? The second time to recover the remnant of the people. Hmm. Which shall be left. And then he mentions all the nations. Babylon included. And he shall set up an ensign, a sign for the nations. And shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So this is prophesied. This movement, this call out. From all these regions. 1 Corinthians 10. I would not have you be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud. And all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses. In the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And the same spiritual drink. Which was Christ. But with many of them. God was. Not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Will anti-type be the same as the type? I think so. They were our examples to the intent that we should not lust of the evil things as they lusted. Neither be idolaters. So will we have lusting? Will we have idolatry as some of them? Eating and drinking, could it possibly be a problem in our ranks? Think so? Fornication? Hmm. And in one day, three and twenty thousand fell. They tempted Christ. They were destroyed by serpents. They murmured. Huh. And this was an example to us. Therefore, if you think you stand, be careful. Now, if we are repeating this history, we must study it carefully. We have the same disobedience. We have the same objectionable features. I've been shown 
that the spirit of the world is fast leavening the church, this church. You are following the same path as did ancient Israel. Now I can speak with authority. It's not me saying this. There is the same falling away from your holy calling as God's peculiar people. You're having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Your concord with unbelievers has provoked the Lord's displeasure. Do we have liaisons? You know not the things that belong to your peace and they are fast being hid from your eyes. Your neglect to follow the light will place you in a more unfavorable position than the Jews upon whom Christ pronounced the woe. We're in serious trouble. Our church is in serious trouble. The sin of ancient Israel was in disregarding the expressed will of God and following their own way according to the leadings of unsanctified hearts. Modern Israel is fast following in their footsteps and the displeasure of the Lord is as surely resting upon them. We are in trouble. Five testimonies. The same disobedience and failure which were seen in the Jewish church have characterized in a what? In a greater degree the people who have had this great light from heaven in the last messages of warning. Shall we, like them, squander our opportunities and privileges? until God shall permit oppression and persecution to come upon us? I'm afraid the answer is yes. Yes, it'll happen. Will the work which might be performed in peace and comparative prosperity be left undone until it must be performed in days of darkness under pressure of trial and persecution? What is your answer to that question? I think the answer is yes. So let's have a look at some of the parallels. And please, I don't want anyone to misunderstand this, these lectures. These lectures are not designed to hit or knock any faction or anyone in the church. This is not a call to condemnation. This is a call to contemplation. The Exodus movement was based on a definite time prophecy. You know, people always, as I said, say to me, why should I join this church? Study the prophecy, then you will join this church. You have no choice. The mixed multitude went out with Israel because that was the only way to go. Isn't that right? So a mixed multitude will come with this church because that's the only way to go. So many people say to me, but I follow Christ. Well, that's fine. You can follow a bodiless head. Some people love the church more than Christ and they can follow a headless body. Christ, the head, has a body. And he said unto Abram, Know of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them and shall afflict them 400 years. There's a definite time prophecy. And also that nation whom they shall serve will, will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. Genesis 15, 14. Now did they stay exactly 400 years? Answer is no. Exodus 12, verse 14. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. 30 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So here's a 30 year discrepancy. So Israel did not leave Egypt till 30 years after the 400 year prophecy. And notice that the Advent movement proper also started about 30 years after the close of the 1260 day prophecy. So there's an interesting parallel. Revelation 12 verse 2, But the court which is about the temple leave out, measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles. And the holy city that shall tread underfoot the 42 months, the 1260 day prophecy, which ended in 1798. 
And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. So there we have that time period. So the final call out of Babylon continues until the cup of iniquity is filled for the world as it was to be filled by the Canaanite nations. So we have these perfect parallels in the church in type and in antitype. We read, with unerring accuracy, the infinite one still kept an account with all nations. While his mercy is tendered, with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. But when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. There is no more pleading of mercy in their behalf. So there's the message. There's the call out. And then it'll come. The time of the Ammonites is not yet full. And it'll come. When the nations are full, the crisis is fast approaching. The time for God's visitation has about come. Although loath to punish, nevertheless he will punish, and that speedily. Those who walk in the light will see the signs of the approaching evil, but they are not to sit in quiet, unconcerned expectancy of the ruin, comforting themselves with the belief that God will shelter his people in the day of visitation. Far from it. They should realize that it is their duty to labor diligently to save others looking with strong faith to God for help. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we have a work to do. The time will last a little longer until the inhabitants of earth have filled up the cup of their iniquity. If you look at the world today, do you think it's close? And when the wrath of God, which has so long slumbered, will awake, and this land of light will drink the cup of his unmingled rock, the cup of iniquity is nearly filled and the retributive justice of God is about to descend upon the guilty. Not much time left. Again, the wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. That was written in 1902. What's it look like now? More than 100 years later. Transgression has almost reached its limits. Confusion fills the world. Great terror is soon to come. In the parallels, amazing. As in the days of the Exodus, the Sabbath will be prominent in the antitype. Type, antitype. Isaiah 56, Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that lays hold on it, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, keeps his hand from doing any evil, neither let the son of the stranger that joined himself to the Lord. So here was the Sabbath. Sabbath will be prominent in the last day as well. Take hold of his covenant. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughter. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord. You know these texts. But the parallels are fascinating. The Lord God which gathered the outcasts of Israel said, Yet will I gather others to them besides those that are gathered unto him. So we had a typical gathering and we'll have an anti-typical gathering. So in both movements, God not only calls the faithful, but he brings all classes into his ranks. Is it right? So that they may learn from him in the wilderness experience. The rebels and the unfaithful ones are then purged from his people. That's how he worked in the past. That's how he'll work now. Ezekiel 20 verse 38, I will purge out from among you the rebels Psst. that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. Same in Revelation 3.16, here we have the parallels. I will spew you out of my mouth. Type and anti-type. So the exodus out of Egypt implies, of course, that there was a former ingress into Egypt. That's logical. Can't come out of something to which you are not. This took place when Jacob moved to Egypt because of famine. And if we think typologically, famine is a symbol of spiritual famine. And because of spiritual famine in the church, we've moved into what? 
into Egypt. Become more and more like the world. The religion of Israel became contaminated with heathen practices. And so God called them out of Egypt. There was sun worship, Amon Ra, the sun god. And if you look at the name Pharaoh, Fa-Ra, the sun. Ezekiel. I like this prophet. And we'll deal with him a little more later. Because he's one of the prophets for the remnant that was in Babylon in captivity and later had to come up. And I say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel and lifted up my hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted my hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord, in the day that I lifted up my hand to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into the land that I had despised for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of the lands, then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes. Make clean. And defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So we must be cleansed of the idolatry of Egypt. Ezekiel 20 verse 8. But, horrible word, what did they do? Rebelled. And would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And then he poured out his anger. But I wrought for my name's sake that I should not be polluted before the heathen. <laughs> Therefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. So God brings his people just like that in our days also. And so in both movement, God calls out to people and brings them into the wilderness so that they can keep his law. And that's what has to happen to each one of us and he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness why so that they may observe his statutes and keep his laws so what's the wilderness for cleansing but there's a mixed multitude with them here they come out of Egypt with a mixed multitude now I like that word there it doesn't say a mixed minority does it no, it says a mixed multitude accompanied Israel on their journey. Many lusted after the flesh pots of Egypt, but of course we don't have people who do that. Eh? <laughs> Victory must be gained over the customs and practices of Babylon and Egypt so God's people can become a separate people. This is the war. And it rages then and it rages now. The parallels are perfect. Lusting after Egypt, Acts 7, 39-42. To whom our fathers would not obey. But thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. How did they turn back to Egypt? That's critical in their hearts. They didn't physically go back to Egypt. They were in the church. But their heart was not in the church. Their heart was where? It was in Egypt. Saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we what not what is become of him. Ah, we would never cast the prophet aside like that, would we? Nah, not us. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto idols. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven. As it is written in the book of prophets, O ye house of Israel, ye have offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. Pathetic. That's what they did. So let's look at the Advent movement prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9. God's people are called from the bondage of Babylon and Egypt. And a distinct time prophecy heralded their exodus, just like the other one. So for 1,260 years, God's people would be afflicted. 2,300-day prophecy heralds the second advent. So there's a distinct time prophecy. So the advent movement message also went out some years before 1844. Some 30 years after 1798, the Millerites started preaching. Exactly the same happened to the Exodus movement. So William Miller starts preaching. 
But the Advent movement proper doesn't begin until 1844 is fulfilled. It's exactly the same. God's people cannot enter Canaan until probation of the world is closed, until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Same happens to God's people here. Why in Exodus? Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, that they may serve me, and if you refuse to let them go, then you're in trouble. The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, tell him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve you. Pharaoh doesn't want to let them go. The modern Pharaoh doesn't want to let them go. He says they're mine. And he wants to take the bride. He wants to say it's his. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go up and gather it, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. So this bread, we're going to have a whole lecture on this bread. Isn't it interesting that Egypt worshipped the dragon? Ezekiel 29, 3. Speak and say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers, which has said, My river is mine own, and have made it for myself. Dragon worship, antitype. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Type, anti-type. Separate people, Nehemiah. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, and he mentions all of these groups, they separated themselves from the lands and unto the law of God. And what do their hearts do? They want to go back. Wherefore come out from amongst them, Second Corinthians, be separate. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Have we done that as a church? Have we done it? Are we in ecumenical councils? Yeah, we'd be blind. We'd be doing ostrich theology if we didn't know that we were doing that. Are we sitting on committees? Are we even chairperson persons of those committees? Yes. So Moses tried to introduce Sabbath reforms in Egypt. Was impossible. Cannot keep Sabbath reform with people who don't keep Sabbath. They might respect you publicly for your stand, but behind your back they will try and stab you. So you have to separate. The king of Egypt said, Wherefore do you, Moses, let the people from their works get ye unto your burdens? He makes an anti Sabbath law. Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them Shabbat, you make them keep the Sabbath, rest, get you to your burdens. And so they had to make more straw, bricks. Antitype, exactly the same. And the tale of the bricks which they had made, therefore ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish, let their work be laid upon the men. So the Egyptian counterfeited God's miracles. And they showed that they were great. They probably used enchanted snakes, made them stiff as boards, and threw them down and removed, just like they can do in India today, that hypnotic spell. And there the serpents move around. God says, well, eat those serpents. And, well, Moses' staff ate them up. So we have lying wonders. We have the same thing there. There's a final gathering. Isaiah 56 Keep your judgment, do justice, my salvation is near, righteousness revealed, blessed is the man that doeth this, son of the stranger, let him not say, I've been despised, the Lord has utterly separated me from the people, the eunuch, all of those that have been unfruitful, choose the things that please me, take hold of my covenant, I will give them a better place than sons of daughters. So God is gathering a people. This is the second gathering. I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. All of those things. So there was Sabbath reform in Egypt, Exodus. There will be Sabbath reform in the antitype. So you have to choose a church that preaches Sabbath reform. Is that church going to perfectly keep the Sabbath or is it going to rebel? 
Well, if the antitype is to meet the type, they're going to be rebellious. The Sabbath is the center of God's law. It was placed in the Ark of the Covenant, in the center of the Holy of Holies, in the center of the priestly tribe, in the center of the camp of Israel, and the Lord placed Israel in the center of the nations. Boom. And exactly the same will happen to God's people. Israel was lax in Sabbath observance, but will be lax in Sabbath observance. Far more sacredness is attached to the Sabbath than is given to it by the professed Sabbath keepers. The Lord has been greatly dishonored by those who have not kept the Sabbath according to the commandment, either in the letter or the spirit. He calls for reform. I've seen amazing things in the world on what happens on a Sabbath. And I don't know where reverence went to. There are incredible things happening on a Sabbath day. But type has to meet anti-type. Israel experienced the midnight deliverance. Isn't that right? The Advent movement, a midnight cry, and we'll have a midnight deliverance. Type meets anti-type. Israel sang the song of Moses. And those that come out of the great tribulation will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So if they're going to sing the song of Moses at the end of time, they must have a similar experience. You can't sing a song that you can't understand. I wonder who's going to lead out in that song. Have you thought about that? It was a woman who led out in the type. Do you think it could be a woman who might lead out in the anti-type? Wasn't it Miriam who led out in the type? I wonder if there will be this resurrection and another singer lead out. One that's not very well accepted anymore. Israel had with them a mixed multitude. The Advent movement will have with them a mixed multitude. Now, here again, careful, careful, careful. It's easy to say they are the mixed multitude. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sakot, about 600,000 foot, etc. And a mixed multitude went up with them. And then we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, in this multitude were not only those who were actuated by faith in the God of Israel, but also a far greater number who desired only to escape from the plagues. Bread and fish Adventists were amongst them. Hmm. And they were moved by excitement and curiosity. They were a snare. The mixed multitude that came up with the Israelites we're a source of continual temptation and trouble. Will we have that as well? Yes or no? They profess to have renounced idolatry, but their early education and training had molded their habits and their character. And they were more or less corrupted with idolatry and with irreverence for God. So we'll have the same in the antitype. They were often the ones to stir up strife. They were the first to complain. They leave in the camp with their idolatrous practices and their murmurings against God. We are repeating the history. After three days journey, open complaint was heard. These originated where? With a mixed multitude, many of whom were not fully united with Israel. The complainers were not pleased with the direction of the march. They were finding fault with Moses, was leading them. Do you think the anti-type will find fault with the anti-typical Moses? The direction in which he is leading? Hmm. This was contagious and it soon spread in the encampment. Psalms, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not the word. They murmured in their tents. They hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. They lifted up his hand against them. He overthrew them in the wilderness. The Lord punished them. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor. <laughs> they ate sacrifices of the dead. We wouldn't do that. Or would we say uh, common communion is okay? What is that, by the way? Isn't that a sacrifice to the dead? They provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague broke out amongst them. That was the type. And what did, 
what does the spirit of prophecy say? We are better or worse than them? Worse. Idolatry at Sinai. Can't happen to us. While Moses was absent, it was time of waiting and suspense. And during this period of waiting, there was a time for them to meditate upon the law. And what did they do? No, 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 no. Uh -uh. Humbling their hearts, they could have done this. And who was at fault again? Especially the mixed multitude. They were impatient. They wanted to go to the land flowing with milk and honey. Feeling their helplessness and the absence of their leader, they returned to their old superstition. The mixed multitude, first to indulge in murmuring, impatience, they were the leaders in the apostasy that followed. <laughs> now, a word of warning before I get to this one. Who actually made that cough? Aaron made it. And who was he? High priest. Now, do we have high priests today that make golden calves and that bring in all kinds of strange worship with dancing around some... And let me phrase this nicely. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> do we have it today, yes or no? Yes, we have it. We have golden calves for Africa, as we say in our, our continent. That means it's everywhere. Now, if I sit in judgment and I see the high priest, that would be what? The division president, the union president, the whatever president, bringing it into the conference. What would my natural reaction be? To condemn him to hell. Right? Did God condemn Aaron to hell? Uh-uh. No. Now if I saw another high priest who kept the commandments, who paid his tithe, who did offerings of mint and whatever, how would I judge him? Man, that's a fine man. At least he stands for principle. Could he turn out to be Caiaphas? Eh? Who stood for everything that was right? And was so in love with his church he was prepared to sacrifice Christ to keep it? Right or wrong? So where's my judgment? My judgment is where I see, right? What I see, what I observe. But my judgment could be totally at fault. I could embrace Caiaphas and kick poor old Aaron out, right? When actual fact, Aaron was just weak. I had an experience once. It was in, well, it was still Czechoslovakia at that stage. It's been split up since then. But Czechoslovakia, there was a pastor. And he was going 10 to a dozen with a guitar around his neck. I've seen a number of those pastors. The worst one I ever saw was in the United States of America. When he appeared on the stage with an earring hanging down to hear an electric guitar around his neck, and that was his sermon. But nevertheless, I've seen it all. And here was this pastor, and he was one of these. He hated my message. He loathed it. He couldn't stand it. And then he went home one night, and he had an ailing Mother or grandmother, I can't remember now. Old, old lady. And she attended the lectures. And then this old, old lady said to this pastor, Now I can die in peace. Because I know that the Advent message is still alive. And you know what? That pastor changed like that. Put away his guitar came to me and said, I hated your message. But that so stunned me what she said that I started listening to it all over again. And I can see something that she saw. Thank you. So, my judgment would have been Aaron. But God sees what? He sees the heart. So let's be careful how we judge liberal 
presidents and leaders in the church. And also, let us be careful how we judge very elite, firm people in the world. Because I don't know. I have to wait for what? For the fruit. I have to wait for the fruit. Israel clamored after meat. The same will be true for the Advent movement. The mixed multitude will not like the health reform. They came out of Egypt, but Egypt did not come out of them. So we have them in the church. They clamored after the flesh meat. Although abundantly supplied with manna. I've got this lecture coming, nothing but this manna. <laughs> they were not satisfied, the Israelites, doing their, during their bondage. It said, we don't have to read it all. You can read it on the screen. So here they were. They clamored after the flesh pots. In my country, ah, it is the exception to find even the pastors who don't eat meat. They are like hen's teeth. They're so scarce. And it's the same in our church. We're doing exactly the same things. How did God deal with Israel? God in mercy called them from the Egyptians that they might worship him without hindrance. He wrought for them in the way by miracles. He proved and tried them by bringing them into straight places. After all these wonderful dealings, they murmured. Would to God we had died in the hand of in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, they lusted for the leeks and the onions. Then said to the angel, you have done worse than they. So we have done worse than they. And by the way, what did they lust for? Leeks and onions. Is that off the menu, by the way? <laughs> no, leeks and onions aren't off the menu. But to lust for Anything, even the good things, is off the menu. So the mixed multitude also hang around the outskirts and complain. The position of each tribe was specified. Each was to march and to encamp beside its own standard as the Lord had commanded. Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard, etc., etc. Congregation shall they pitch. As they encamp, so shall they set forward. The mixed multitude that had accompanied Israel from Egypt were not permitted to occupy the same quarters with the tribes, but were to abide on the outskirts of the camp, and their offspring were to be excluded from the community until the third generation. Now, most of us, if we weren't born Adventists, we came into this church, and by definition, we're a mixed multitude. I'm a mixed multitude. And it's easy to hang around the camp and to criticize everyone in the camp. It's easy to separate myself too. Now let's see who they were. But with many of them, God were not pleased. They were the ones that, 1 Corinthians, they lusted. They're the ones that were the idolaters. They're the ones that uh, made eating and drinking their God. And they rose up to play. They were sports fanatics. We don't have them, eh? No. And neither let us commit fornication, as some of them did and fell. Could be spiritual forn fornication. Okay, if you, if you look at this list, and you ask yourself, am I a mixed multitude? Could we qualify? Hmm. Neither let us tempt Christ. Neither let us murmur. I, oh, I think here we all stumble. I think we've just had it. We've just been defined as the mixed multitude. We're in trouble. Now all these things happen to them as an example. They follow the Lord afar off and remain on the outskirts of the camp. They keep us wandering in the wilderness of sin. They keep back the blessings of the early and the latter rain. And they are the multitude. Their lot is to be shaken out. So, do we murmur? Do we murmur against everything that happens? There's a difference between murmuring and calling sin by its right name. There's a big difference. Ezekiel, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people 
and I will plead with you face to face. We're going to have tough personal experiences with God. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness, I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will purge out from you the rebels. That was the type. What will the anti-type be? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Many are unconverted whose names are on the church books. Don't be surprised if most of the church leaves us. Let these words be repeated by men who are consecrated. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We must say I'm sinful and polluted, but the wrath of God rested upon his divine son. There's a way out. If God has given his only begotten son to die, the just for the unjust, he wants every voice to proclaim it. So we have to become preachers. Now I've already mentioned this. Heresies have a purpose in the church. We go ballistic over the heresies in the church. And believe me, there are heresies in this church. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in amongst them, which will sift them separating the chaff from the wheat. Five testimonies. So are we the false church or the fallen church, or Babylon, because there are heresies amongst us? No. But God has permitted the heresies in our church. And we'll talk about heresies as we go along. We'll call sin by its real name. But it still remains God's church, and this is what's important. I have to explain as an evangelist to people why they must come to this church with all of these things. This light should lead us to a diligent study of the scriptures and most critical examination of the positions we hold. Are we right or are we wrong? Check it out. Study the scriptures. Go back to the word. Go to the spirit of prophecy. Make sure. Believers are not to rest in supposition and ill-defined ideas as to what constitutes truth. You have to study for yourselves. You have to eat that heavenly manna every day. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us and those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. <laughs> and rather than subject themselves to derision and insult, imprisonment and death, they'll leave the church. They'll go. And it's coming. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel. Many a star that we have admired for his brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Don't look to anyone. Don't look to me. There might be a banana peel on my way. And then are you going to say, well, that guy didn't make it or whatever? No, no, no. Forget about anybody in the church. Look to Jesus. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away in the wind. It'll happen. When trees without fruit are cut down as cucumbers of the ground, when multitudes of false brethren are distinguished from the true, then the hidden ones will be revealed to view and with hosannas range under the banner of Christ. So there will be two parties in the church. It was in Israel's day. It'll be in our days. Satan will sorely harass the faithful. But in the name of Jesus, they will come off more than conquerors. And then we will be that terrible as an army with banner church. Yeah. Poor old Mark Woodman. He died so young, 35 years old. And about 10 days before, maybe 12 days before he died, he came to visit us. And uh, he was on his last legs. He was walking with a cane. The cancer had spread into his hips and bones. My wife was still lying with a smashed hip. She couldn't walk. And I'd hurt my back. And when we went out to the car, he was leaning on his cane. <laughs> my wife was leaning on two. <laughs> and I was walking like this. <laughs> we were such a sight. And as we went to his car, I said, Mark, here comes the army of the Lord. 
and Satan is trembling in his boots. <laughs> That's us. We're pathetic. But Christ, he's powerful. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters has one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our character to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Today we have a theology, ah, the Lord will do it all. No, 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 you have to do your part. Let's not make it that easy, then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples. We'll have to see. How's the latter rain going to be and how's it going to fall? Now is the time to heed the admonition of the council to Laodicea. Now's the time. We have to work. So the Exodus movement, like the end time church, was structured. It was ordered. There was order in the camp. The Advent movement must be structured and ordered. Isn't that logical? Parallels must be there. Great similarity between our history and that of the children. God led his people from Egypt in the wilderness, etc. They were encamped close by them. Yet what was the Israelite? A great flood of light illuminating the whole camp, shedding brightness upon their path. Uh, was darkness to Pharaoh. I tell you, brethren, the Lord has an organized body through whom he will work. Don't tear down the church just because there's apostasy in it. Just because there are literally thousands of Aaron's and I don't know how many Caiaphas's. When anyone is drawing apart from the organized body of God's commandment keeping people, when he begins to weigh the church in his human scales and begins to pronounce judgment against them, then you may know that God is not leading him. He's on the wrong track. We must stop these voices from both sides, from the conservative side and the liberal side. How many of the leaders say, those are not Seventh-day Adventists that are preaching the three angels' messages. Have you heard that? Or well, they belong to some separatist groups when they're bringing people. Do you baptize people into independent ministries or do you baptize them into the church? Where's the tithe go to? These are questions we must ask. Does it go to the church? God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed. They were ordered. There was a structure. God's end time church must have a structure. Not some airy fairy loose thing without a body. The government of Israel was characterized by the most thorough organization. Wonderful alike for its completeness and simplicity. The order so strikingly displayed in the perfection and arrangement of all created works. And here were all the captains, the chiefs of princes and the captains of tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands. There was order. Deuteronomy 1.15. Absolute precision. So God's church is organized and funded by tithes and offerings, as was Israel. And God has summoned the church, apostles, prophets, etc. So the SDA church has a president. Is it for me to judge whether he's Caiaphas or Aaron? No. Con corresponds to the position of Moses as the administrative head. Division presidents correspond to the tribal princes of Israel. Captains of thousands, fifties and tens correspond to union presidents, conference presidents, pastors and elders. Their structure. Absolute parallels. Are they perfect? No. Israel robbed God in tithes and offerings. Will we do that? Yes. Will a man rob God? You have robbed God, the work of God, which should be going forward with tenfold its present strength and efficiency is kept back. Like a spring season held by the chilling blast of winter because some of God's professed people are appropriating to themselves the means that should be dedicated to his service. I've realized long ago that I'll never make it if I don't pay my tithe. People constantly tell me I can't afford to pay my tithe. I say, that's stupid. You can't afford not to. It's true, isn't it? If I don't pay my tithe, I won't make it. My expenses quadruple my outlay. I don't know how I'll make it. 
It just happens. It's a miracle. If I had to explain to the receiver of revenue how it works, it's a nutcase. It works that way. The Exodus movement was led by God. There was a pillar of cloud. So the Advent movement is led by God. We have to believe it. Christ was the pillar. He was the protector. All did drink of the same spiritual rock. For surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior in all their afflictions. He was afflicted. All of these sayings, he was the leader. Same with us. Satan is now using every device in the sealing time to keep the minds of God people from the present truth. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and the reproof of instruction are in the way of life. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. These are magnificent words. The accident movement was led by a prophet. Do you think the antitype will have to be led by a prophet? Then what is this I hear from so many leaders that we cannot be bound by 19th century literature? Have you heard that? I've heard worse than that. I'll come to that later. By a prophet. By the way, were there more prophets besides Moses? Wasn't Miriam a prophetess? Yes. But the Bible says by a prophet, the Lord brought out Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. Now, let's look at some of these parallels. Moses was given a vision of Canaan. And the final deliverance before his death. Ellen White was given a vision of the heavenly Canaan and the final deliverance before her death. Isn't that an interesting parallel? Moses was meek and humble. Ellen White, as far as I can read, was meek and humble. In my next vision, I earnestly begged for the Lord that I must go and relate what he had shown me. Uh, if I must go and relate what he had shown me, he would keep me from exaltation. Then he showed me that my prayer was answered. <laughs> I've prayed prayers like that. Sometimes you regret having prayed a prayer like that. <laughs> and if I should be in danger of exaltation, his hand would be laid upon me and I would be afflicted with sickness, said the angel. If you deliver the message faithfully and endure until the end, you shall eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink of the water of the river of life. Moses was afraid to tell Israel, wasn't he? That the Lord had appeared to him, so was Ellen White afraid to relate her vision. Moses died on the borders of Canaan. Did Ellen White go into Canaan or did she die on the borders? She died on the borders. She received a vision on health reform. Did Moses receive a vision on health reform? Yes. Leviticus. Health reform. Both of them had health reform. Goes further. Moses wrote the Pentateuch to sustain the people of God on their journey. Ellen White wrote the testimonies to sustain the antitype. The Israels rebelled against Moses. The Advent movement rebels against the spirit of prophecy. Is there a parallel? Those who enter paradise restored must retrace all the steps in rebellion and apostasy. We must learn to eat, dress, drink, act in harmony with our high calling. There are the parallels. If you reject the prophet, you're like the mixed multitude. We have whole conferences, whole unions that reject the spirit of prophecy. We have some that print their own quarterlies because they don't want to mention the spirit of prophecy. I can tell you stories about people in tears because of what is happening in our church. And we say we're Babylon? No. We're just the perfect fulfillment of prophecy. We're the antitype. And if it weren't like that, we wouldn't be who we are. Satan hates the testimonies and our success or failure as individuals or as a church. Depends upon our attitude towards the instruction given through this medium. 
One of our directors at one of our top universities says we cannot be dictated to by a woman with only three years of education. So I wrote a document in which I, which I sent to him where I said if God should speak to you even through a donkey and you refuse to obey him, you could have a confrontation with the angel of the Lord. Needless to say, I didn't get an answer. <laughs> Revelation 12 verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and he went to make war. So what church are you going to look for? You're going to look for a pathetic church. The blind, the poor, the wretched, the naked, the rebellious, the idolatrous. <laughs> oh boy, they reject the spirit of prophecy. They're pathetic. Have you found one like that? Good. The gift would be slighted. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. You know all these things. I'm just showing some parallels here. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimonies. From the highest level. You can use it for homiletics, but uh, not for exegesis. Hello, you can't use the prophet for exegesis. <laughs> How else are you going to know what the Bible says if you can't even trust the prophets to tell you what the Bible says? He will bring in spurious visions to mislead and mingle the false. Have we got many of those in the church today? Hundreds. And so disgust people that they will regard everything that bears the name of vision as a species of fanaticism. But... Honest soul, by contrasting false and true, will be enabled to distinguish between them. Read it for yourself. Don't read what someone says about it. And some of our independent ministries, they mean so well. They summarize exactly how you must live worth, word by word for you. This is what you must do to be right with God. And they put it into your hand and say, this is how you live. Misery. Misery. Because it's not balanced by the other statements in the spirit of prophecy. Read it yourselves. Take it. Read it. Sit and read Desire of Ages. Read the testimonies. When testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this. They will not stop. And he redoubles his effort till he launches them into open rebellion, which becomes incurable and ends in destruction. I've been shown that the spirit of the world is fast leavening the church. You are following the same path as did ancient Israel. There's the same falling away from your holy calling as God's peculiar people. You're having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You concord with unbelievers has provoked the Lord's displeasure. Do we have concord with unbelievers? Do we sit in council with them? Yes, we do. Does this make my church Babylon? No. No. I've been shown that unbelief in the testimonies has been increasing as people backslide from God. It is all through our ranks, all over the field. It has to be like that. Israel did it, we do it. No one can say how long will this continue. No one knows how great the mercy has been towards us. But if you are heartily devoted to God, this is not a very good picture of our church. A revival of true godliness amongst us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. So don't see what I'm saying as a criticism. It's just an explanation of the condition. That's what we are. That's what we are as a people. The time has come for a thorough reformation to take place. When this reformation begins, the spirit of prayer will actuate every believer and will banish from the church the spirit of discord and strife. We need that as a church. Please, Aaron. Please. Don't continue with what you are doing. Repent. 
And please, mixed multitudes, stop complaining and trying to play God and decide who's Aaron and who's Caiaphas. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and the heart, resurrection from the spiritual death, and reformation signifies a regeneration, a change in ideas and theories. So, reformation means change your theology. It doesn't save you. You also need a revival. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You can change your ideas, you can change your mind, that's fine. But you've got to apply it. So here are some warnings from the experience of Israel. The religion of many amongst us will be the religion of apostate Israel. There it is, it's plain as day. They love their own way and forsake the way of the Lord. Because of Israel's disobedience and departure from God, they were allowed to be brought into close places. And we will be brought into a close place and Satan will be permitted to make war against us. We're going to go towards a shaking. And it will be brought about by persecution. I would not that you be ignorant how that our fathers were under a cloud. And we have this beautiful study. I urge that the chapters be read. Read it. Make sure. With the history of the children of Israel before us, let us take heed and not be found committing the same sins, following in the same way of unbelief and rebellion. We think that they were stupid. No, we're stupid. Spirit of Elijah, what must we do? John was to go forth to bring to men the light of God, give new direction to their thoughts, impress them with the holiness of God's requirement, the need for his righteousness, that we must be holy, we must stop this new theology that only leads to perdition, we must be a temple for the indwelling God. We must have sound physical constitution. So we must live healthily. It doesn't mean you won't be safe from injury and accident and disease and die even of cancer. Young people, 35 years old, being riddled and dying of cancer before your eyes. It doesn't mean that you won't die. Mental and spiritual strength, control of appetite and passions, control all these powers. Do we do these things? There were two crossings. There were two disappointments. They found no water. They could not drink of the waters of Mara. They were bitter. And the people murmured against Moses. And the Lord showed him a tree. Remember that? And he said, cast it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. There he made from a statute an ordinance. Give ear to his commandments, and you'll have none of these diseases. Now, what's happened to us? Why are we in this state? At Marah, the Lord showed Moses a tree. When it was cast into the waters, they were made sweet. The Advent movement of the Great Disappointment, 1844, was given a reed like a rod, that's like a tree, to measure the sanctuary, and the sanctuary true, the key to sweet waters, was found. Here's a beautiful parallel. I love type and anti-type. The voice which heard from heaven spoke unto me, and go into the little book which is open, this is Revelation 10, and remember, the angel standing there and he had to eat the scroll and it was bitter and it was made sweet. That's the message. And it was made sweet by the uncovering of the great truths and they had to go and prophesy again to many peoples and nations and tongues the truth of the three angels' messages. So we had the same experience. Exactly the same. And there was given me a reed like a rod Measure the temple and the altar and them that worship in them. Now let's go from Mara to Sinai. Israel was taken directly from their bitter disappointment to the solemnity of sin, Sinai. So the Advent movement went from the bitter disappointment to the antitypical Sinai. Moses said unto them, 
Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. And he brought them out of the Egypt. So, what happened at Sinai? Now this is very important. They received the law. Is that the only thing that they received there? What else did they receive? Moses received instructions on the sanctuary. So there was the law, but the application of obedience lay in the sanctuary message. They loved the law, they exalted the law, but they made the sanctuary just a ritual. Do we do the same? So the law alone brings only condemnation. So without the sanctuary, there's no salvation. Because the sanctuary message points to the solution. Points to Christ. And at the foot at Sinai, God gave Moses the sanctuary vision. Similarly, Ellen White was given the great sanctuary vision after the great disappointment. Isn't that a fantastic parallel? The law and the righteousness by faith, they go together. And what do we as Adventists do? We love to separate them and argue like school children over the issue. And then I believe that I'm saved because I have the right understanding of a doctrine. Please. What about the poor Bushman who never heard of doctrine who's going to be saved? The efficacy of Christ frees us from the condemnation of the law. It imputes and imparts his righteousness unmerited by us. We've got to swallow the Laodicean message and restores the broken relationship with God. It empowers the children of God to die to self, to live in harmony with his law of liberty. It transfers the law from the tablets of stone to the tablets of the heart. Sealing the new covenant. I don't know. I've tried to sum it up there. I don't know whether that does it. You can't do justice to these great truths. Now, just look at the Adventist experience. It's fascinating. This is the depiction of the way of life from paradise lost to paradise restored. And it was painted in 1876. What's in the middle of this picture? The law. And Christ is there on the side. So then the Adventists start thinking about this later on after 1888 and they start saying that there's a problem with that picture. So in 1883, around about that time, they change it. Who's in the middle now? Now where's the law? It's sort of here, mystically, somewhere, wherever. So now, that's better. Is it? I still think it's wrong. Personally. My own personal opinion, it's still wrong. 1980. This is a modern depiction of the same thing. Nothing much changed. It's about the same. And that's very evangelical. This is my opinion. I don't know whether it's right. But you can't separate Christ from his law. You can't. The character of God and the character of the law. You know these slides. I don't have to repeat them. The character of God is just. The law is just. The character of God is true. The law is true. They're all the verses. His character is pure. The law is pure. Light, light. Faithful, faithful. Good, good. Spiritual, spiritual. Holy, holy. Truth, truth. Life, life. Righteousness, righteousness. Perfect, perfect. Forever, forever. Can you separate God from his character? By the way, what is it that we take to heaven? It's the only thing we take is our character. So, if we could come back to preaching the two in harmony, isn't that the everlasting gospel? The everlasting gospel is Christ, my surety and my sacrifice. But he's also Christ, my king, which means obedience to his character principles. So we've tried to separate these two and we have strife in the church. Bring them together and nobody has to give up anything. The legalist can cling to his law. 
the liberal can cling to Jesus. And if the two marry, they'll have to give up both of their extremes and they'll have everything. And we can solve the problem. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, with which my covenant they break. We do the same. Although I was a husband unto them, but this shall be the covenant that I will make. After those days I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be their people. Away with all this argument in the church. This is the covenant, Hebrews, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord. Same thing. I'll put it in their minds. I'll write it in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Perfect parallels between ancient Israel and us. But that's just 1844. Does it get better or does it get worse as they wander along? It gets worse. It gets worse. So if that was the beginning, then what will the end be? What happens after the second generation? What happens after the third generation? I will punish the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation. Are we past the fourth generation of Adventism? Yes or no? And then I will gather them. We're living in interesting times. Fascinating times. And how we relate to type and anti-type will determine whether we go into Canaan or whether we die in the wilderness. Because with many of them, God was not well pleased and they died in the wilderness. So type will have to meet anti-type there as well. May God bless us as we look at our own positions and decide, are we amongst the mixed multitude on any of those points? Am I judgmental and judge before the time? Lord, who sowed these tears? Shall we go and pluck them up? We're wonderful gardeners. Have you noticed that? Shall we go and pluck them up? What did the Lord say? Leave them. Because you don't know whether you're going to pluck up or what? A wheat together with that tear. And then, by the way, do you know that it is a tear? I would certainly have removed Manasseh. I think Isaiah will be very surprised to see him in heaven. Don't you think so? I think so. So let's think about these things and let's not use these lectures as a hammer. Let's use them as a tool for reconciliation. Let's ask everyone to come back to the standard and back to the truth and back to God. Amen. Amen.